Okay, well, we are a minute over time, so I think we should get started. Uh, so hi, everybody. I am very excited to introduce Dr. Simone Blomberg as our IIDS seminar speaker today. Uh, Dr. Blomberg is both a senior lecturer and a consultant statistician in the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Queensland in Australia. Uh, her research broadly focuses on developing better models of evolution to use in uh, macroevolutionary studies and beyond. Uh, her papers have been instrumental in my own journey to learn more about comparative methods, and I know that many others share that sentiment. So it's, it's really cool to have her here. She's a true statistics wizard, and also her <laughs> Google Scholar profile pictures of Yoda, which I think is another indicator of her awesomeness. Um, so please join me in uh, giving Dr. Blomberg a very warm and caffeinated welcome to give her talk today. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kristen. Okay, so I'll share my screen. Here we go. I hope everyone will be able to see this. Okay. So <clears throat> today uh, for this seminar, I'd like to talk about the problem that you have when you don't have any data. And uh, so we're interested in the case where you have a data set, but there are a lot of missing values in it. And uh, there's been a, a lot of research in the statistics literature how to, how to deal with this problem. Um, and not many biologists are actually aware of what to do, and importantly, what not to do when you're faced with a, uh, a missing data problem like this. Okay, so <clears throat> first, um, before we get started, I'd like to, firstly, I'd like to give it an acknowledgement of country. Um, uh, the land on which I live and work uh, is traditionally owned by the Yagara and Turrbal people. And um, uh, the land, this land was never ceded or sold. It was taken from them, and um, so I'd like to acknowledge the the elders of, the, of those uh, those people, uh, present and past and present elders of those people. And I'd also like to acknowledge the um, uh, the traditional owners of the country of the um, of the land in which you you sit right now, out in Zoomland. Um, so yeah, and um, so more precisely, I'd like to just talk about um, the people that have uh, contributed to this project. Patrick Derlick, who's a Czech student, um, he um, did most of the original programming for the methods that I'm going to talk about today. And Amelia Desbiens um, helped me with a lot of, um, she's, she's a PhD student at the University of Queensland, and she helped with a lot of the testing of the, co of the code. And um, I've also uh, received funding from the Australian Research Council, which is a bit like NSF. Uh, um, but in Australia and also the University of Queensland provides me with desk space and um, other um, useful aspects of my my existence. So that was so um, so. There's my acknowledgements. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is is um, the way missing data really creates big problems uh, for analyses um, in um, uh, in comparative biology and. I'm going to talk a bit about the different approaches to dealing with missing data. And particularly, we're going to talk about complete case analysis or case-wise deletion. Sorry about the spelling mistake here. Um, um, which is probably the most common um, method for dealing with uh, missing data. And, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about inverse probability weighting is another way of handling that, but not too much talk about that because it's not often used in uh, the sorts of um, studies that, that we do. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about maximum likelihood estimates of um, missing data problems, particularly the EM algorithm. And uh, of course, maximum likelihood, met uh, the likelihood methods can be extended uh, to Bayesian methods uh, if you put priors on, on certain parameters in your model. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about single imputation, um, which is just filling in the data uh, with with um, numbers, however you derive them, and multiple imputation, which is the main focus of what I do and my research, um, and that's and I'm going to argue that that's an improvement over, <coughs> over single imputation. Uh, and then I'm going to describe a simulation study that we've done, a really big simulation study, and um, and then finally I'll end up with some conclusions and recommendations for what you should actually do if you have if you're in the situation to have this kind of data yourself or lack of data. 
Okay, so why are missing data a problem? Well, um, if, uh, so a lot of people have been publishing um, uh, large trait data sets uh, to answer really big questions in macroecology and macroevolution. And quite often um, the data come from a large number of species, but not all species are um, studied equally well. And, and that can be for various reasons, for example, um, species, um, some species might be easier to study than others in the sense that they're more available to researchers. They might, uh, some species might be, for example, um, be found closer to um, research universities and some might be more distant. So uh, trying to get data on something from um, Central South America might be a lot more difficult than getting something, uh, data from, from species that live close to Moscow, for example. So there are all these sorts of data sets uh, have been published for all sorts of different uh, taxa and lots of different traits. And this is a typical one here that I just chose um, sort of haphazardly. Uh, this is a trait database for palms, palm trees. And, um, and it's uh, based on uh, the worldwide um, study of palms. And there's a bunch of um, a bunch of variables in this data set. So I'm using the NANIAR package here to have a look at that. It's a really good uh, package for looking at um, um, uh, missing data problems. Um, so you can just download the, the entire database and um, from, from this study site, uh, uh, from this uh, website. I think it's Dryad, I think I got this from. Anyway, you can ask for a summary of the missing variables and you can see that there are there are um, 29 variables in the, um, in the uh, data set. Um, these are the first 10. They've been sorted by the number of missing values. So you can see that um, in this particular data set, there are, uh, for this, for this, the worst variable has um, 1,651 missing values, which is 64.6% of that variable. And so you can see that uh, uh, because they've been sorted this way, um, the percentage drops. Uh, but even like the tenth one has 22% missing data. So the question is, is, is how you can deal with that. So here's another way of looking at that same data set, uh, this time using the VizDAT package for R. And um, so you can see the gray areas are the, uh, so we have the variables in the columns up the top here, and we have the number of observations in the data set uh, on the side. And so there are over two and a half thousand um, uh, species in this data set. And the gray areas that you see, are they're, they're the values that aren't missing. So you can see that, um, so basically the taxonomic variables on the left-hand side here, um, we pretty much know the taxonomy for these, uh, for these palms pretty well. And you can see that, so that's, that's all uh, known data. But you can see for a lot of these other columns here, there's missing data, which is in black. And you can see some of these columns, particularly uh, this one, for example, uh, maximum fruit length in centimeters. Uh, you can see there's a lot of missing data from that. So this is typical of a, of a missing data um, database where you've got large numbers of traits, large numbers of species, but you've got a lot of missing values for a lot of those, a lot of those traits. So overall in this data set, there's 18% missing and 82% present. So that's part of the problem. That's where the problem comes from, the missing data. Um, so if we were to do complete case analysis, um, which basically means we throw out any species that has any missing data whatsoever. So we're only dealing with the complete cases. And so that's called complete case analysis or case-wise deletion. And so if you do that for the palm data set, you lose 87% of all the rows. So you throw, end up throwing out data on 87% of, of the species in the data set. And that's, that's an incredible waste of information. We would like to actually use that information in analyses that, um, <clears throat> that we can do. And so we need a way of dealing with the, uh, the missing data. So <clears throat> if you throw away 87% of your data, um, then this leads to obviously a decreased sample size, which then leads to a loss of power, any sort of analysis that you want to do uh, on that data. And if the data are not missing completely at random, then the parameter estimates will be biased. So if there are, 
uh, if there are biases in uh, the complete cases, if the complete case data uh, species are quite different from the, uh, the missing value species, then you can get problems of bias in your estimates. Okay, and it's important to know that this complete case analysis is the standard way to treat missing data in most statistical software. So normally if you, in, in R especially, mostly I'm gonna be talking about R today, um, if you use, for example, the LM function or the GLM function, their default is to actually remove all the cases with missing data. So, um, so you might not even know you're using um, complete case analysis, um, but um, by default you, you are. So what, what else can we do? First, some terminology. Uh, I mentioned missing completely at random. So I'm just gonna go through a couple of definitions here of what I mean when I say missing at random. So uh, missing completely at random is, is what we would normally think of when we're thinking of missing at random data. And it's the probability of a particular cell in a data set being missing, being unrelated to any variable inside or outside the data set. So it's just complete random, the missing data, a complete random sample of the complete, of the full data set. We contrast that with um, missing at random, MAR, uh, where the probability of a cell being missing is related to, related to a variable or more than one variable in the data set. So that means you have information in the data set that relates to the probability of being missing. So, um, and that's, a, that's an important assumption that you should remember uh, later. Uh, so the final thing we can contrast that is with uh, MNAR, missing not at random. So that means the probability of a cell being missing is related to some other variable outside the data set. So, um, so uh, that's an important, uh, and, and missing not at random data is, is probably more common than we assume, but also um, more difficult to deal with because you need to have bespoke solutions for, for those sorts of problems. So I'm not gonna deal with missing not at random data much today. Uh, I'm mainly going to concentrate on missing at random data and missing completely at random data. So missing completely at random is unlikely for these trait databases that we've uh, talked about. Missing at random is less strict, but is it's basically an untestable assumption because if you knew that your um, uh, missing values were related to uh, a variable in your study, um, then um, um, yeah, so, yeah, so um, if um, the missing values uh, are related to a variable in your study, then if you knew the, that relationship, then you could actually fill in, probably estimate the missing values anyway, and they wouldn't be missing. So, uh, and like I said, missing not at random is difficult to, to treat. Okay, so what can we do besides case-wise deletion? Well, the first method I want to talk about is inverse probability weighting. And the idea is that we model the missing values for each cell by the, um, and we weight the data um, by the inverse of the probability that a particular case is mis missing. So we weight the observed data in a way that makes up for the missing, the missing data. Um, that's more commonly used uh, in sample surveys. Uh, where, um, so for example, surveys of um, economic surveys or um, public health surveys and, and um, things like that that have been uh, specifically designed. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that in this, um, in this talk because it uh, really hasn't made much of an impact in the uh, ecology and evolution sphere. If you want to have a look at uh, that method though, I can recommend this review here um, by Seaman and White. Uh, in uh, statistic methods for me medical research, which they go into the, um, the theory in a lot of great detail. Okay. So what other methods are there? Well, <clears throat> probably the, the most the easiest to understand is probably maximum likelihood estimation. So um, we, in this context, we call it full information maximum likelihood because you're using all the information in the data set. Uh, and the idea is, is to treat the missing values like parameters in your model and you calculate the maximum likelihood estimates of the missing values along with the parameters of interest. And, and you use uh, an algorithm called the EM algorithm, which we'll talk about in a second. 
And um, so you end up at the end, you end up with um, parameter estimates with standard errors that you can do hypothesis testing on, uh, or you can estimate effect sizes. And, um, and you end up with the maximum likelihood estimates of the missing values themselves. So that's potentially a really good way of analyzing the data. And we can extend that to Bayesian analyses by putting priors on the missing values themselves. So that leads pretty well on to Bayes. And uh, so the sorts of packages that we might come across uh, to deal with, uh, that use this sort of methods is, is Philopars. Uh, so we've now got this new uh, package called R Philopars, which, which does the same thing as the um, previous version of file parts but inside R and it's, uh, it's it's got a few extra bells and whistles as well. So that's probably the main application that, that people have used uh, full information maximum likelihood to do. Uh, there are other packages. Uh, there's one called phylogenetic EM uh, which is developed by this, these people and, um, and, and, that, and that does the same sort of uh, modeling. Uh, I think also um, Liam Ravel's PyTools package also has a function that will do this sort of analysis as well. Okay, so what's the EM algorithm, right? So um, the idea is you have a, a difficult problem with missing data in this case, and you want to you want to answer that question, answer, uh, solve that problem by analyzing a simpler problem, which would be the complete data. So if you had the complete data, you could build your multiple regression models or analysis of variance type models, analysis of covariance models uh, on, the, on the complete data and everything would be fine. Um, you could use standard methods. Uh, but the problem is, is we have this missing data and we need to account for the missing data somehow. So the EM algorithm has two steps, the E step and the M step. So the E step stands for the expectation step. And what you do is you calculate the expectations of the missing values. Um, given the observed data and some estimate of the model parameters. Um, it's not, you can actually estimate, uh, calculate the expectations of the missing values themselves, but what's more common is to um, estimate a sufficient statistic for the missing values, which um, gives you more generality to the algorithm. A bit of a, a, bit of a um, uh, complication that I really don't want to get, get into here. Uh, but essentially, you're using your statistical model to predict the, um, the missing value data. And then there's the, the M step, which is the, is the maximization step. You calculate the new maximum likelihood estimates of the parameters conditional on the proposed missing data values and the observed values. So you, and you alternate between these two steps until you get to convergence, in which case then you have the maximum likelihood estimates. So the idea is, is to first predict the, um, uh, the missing values given the model, and then the, the next, the end step, you estimate the model parameters given the missing, the missing data that you've just predicted and also the observed data. And you alternate between those um, until you get to convergence. So it's a good, it's a simple algorithm. It's really good to, um, uh, to relatively easy to implement. Um, and um, can be a bit slow to converge. And it doesn't actually, um, this algorithm doesn't guarantee convergence to the global maximum likelihood estimates. So it can get stuck on local opt optima. And the um, issue is, um, uh, so, so there are other versions of the EM algorithm which are a little bit more complicated that, that um, attempt to solve that problem. So it, that's the EM algorithm. So at the end result, you get the maximum likelihood estimates of your model parameters. So your regression parameters, your um, differences between treatments or whatever you, you're trying to measure in, in your model. And you also get the missing data values. Uh, so the EM algorithm was developed by Dempster, Laird and Rubin in 1977. And you can see it's, it's been cited over 64,000 times. So that's an amazing citation rate for, for any paper that you can imagine. And this is the paper here, uh, read for the proceedings of the Royal Statistical Society. And um, it's, it's well worth reading if you, if you ever are interested in this sort of issue here. I just want to mention Ruben here, who's the, the senior author on the paper here. This is Don Ruben. And um, 
he was at Harvard for many years. His name crops up all the time in um, missing data problems because he's been working on it for so long and has been so influential. And just as a, an anecdote, um, I've met him a couple of times. He's come to Australia and I actually got to um, attend one of his workshops on missing data and missing data and causal analysis, which is the other area that he's uh, famous for. And um, so uh, a couple of years ago, I thought it would be a good idea. Uh, so he was at Harvard. And so I thought it would be a good idea to try and get to Harvard for a sabbatical and, uh, and study with him. And my idea was to um, uh, go to Harvard and buy Don Rubin a coffee once a week and we would just talk about anything. And that was my aim uh, of what I wanted to do at Harvard. I thought obviously I would have to think up a better project than that, but, um, but that was my aim. So I wrote to Don and said, can I come and study with you at Harvard? And he said, uh, no, you can't because he's moved from Harvard to China. He got sick of the politics at Harvard. So he decided to move to China, which I find quite amazing because I can't imagine the politics in China would be any easier than the politics at Harvard, but you know, that's up to him. So he's, he's now at Tsinghua University where he set up an applied statistics uh, department there. And here he is um, explaining some sort of, um, uh, some sort of concept on, on, a, on a chalkboard there. So his name will come up all the time. Okay, so what else can we do to estimate missing data if we don't want to use maximum likelihood because it's too difficult or um, or any other reason? Uh, we can do single imputation, which is um, basically uh, the examples I'm giving here. Uh, uh, basically, you take your missing data and for, for, for example, the mean imputation method, you just calculate the mean of the observed data and you substitute that in for your missing data values. Or you could get a little bit more complicated and use a regression model to predict what the, what the imputed values should be. Um, there's also what's called hot deck and cold deck methods. Hot deck methods involves um, filling in the missing values uh, with values from within the data set that you have. And cold deck methods involve filling in the missing values with values from another source, from another data set that you may have access to or from theory or uh, any other sort of method. A common one used in medical studies, uh, longitudinal studies, is that uh, the last observation carried forward. So if you're um, studying, um, say for example, um, if you have a, um, a medical data set where you've got observations on patients and you've got missing values for some of those observations, one common technique is, is just to fill in the missing value with the previous value that you, you, um, that you got from them beforehand. So that's called last observation carried forward. And so imputation in general is, is sounds like a, uh, a good thing to do, but uh, you have to be careful. So this quote is really good from Dempster and Rubin. There's that name again. The idea of imputation is both seductive and dangerous. It is seductive because it can lull the user into the pleasurable state of believing that the data are complete after all, and it is dangerous because it lumps together situations where the problem is sufficiently minor that it can be legitimately handled in this way, and situations where standard estimators applied to the real and imputed data have substantial biases. So what they're saying is imputation sounds like a good thing to do, uh, but um, it, you have to be very careful when you're doing it. So this single imputation method is my first um, my first um, recommendation, don't do it, okay? Because it treats the imputed values, the filled in values as if they were real data. When they're not, they're just estimates that you've derived from somewhere else. And, um, and so if you treat the missing values, as the missing, the impute, imputed missing values as real data, then um, your, your, um, uh, your confidence intervals will be too narrow and your, um, p-values will be too small and um, um, because you're actually making extra assumptions in your data that you're not actually taking account of. So don't do sing single imputation. That's probably the main method, the main message that I've got. Okay, so um, multiple imputation is a much better solution if you're going to do imputation. 
And so it's proposed by Don Rubin again in the 1970s for large medical and social science databases. So health surveys, even census data could be used in this sort of way. Um, uh, longitudinal studies of, of um, in medical research as well. Okay, so it's relatively easy to implement, a little bit more difficult than single imputation, but uh, has much better statistical properties. In fact, its properties are as good as the maximum likelihood methods, uh, so long as the assumptions are met. And the main assumption is that the data are missing at random. So if the data are missing at random, um, um, uh, the, the method works well. If the, if the data are missing completely at random, uh, that's okay too, but that's a more strict assumption. So, um, so missing at random works. If the data are missing not at random, then you can't use multiple imputation. Okay, so it corrects the main problem with single imputation, which was um, treating the, the imputations as if they were real data. And once you have your imputed data sets, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, you can analyze them any way you want uh, or, or give them to other people to analyze. Uh, if we compare that with the full in information maximum likelihood method, then we have an issue of, um, um, it's, it's much harder to do that. You have to, uh, uh, each each um, full information maximum likelihood model has to be uh, specifically coded and it only works for that particular model. Whereas uh, multiple imputation, you can you can fit any model you like to your data. Okay, so how can we implement this theory of multiple imputation? Imputation. How do we impute, and what are the methods? Well, the idea behind multiple imputation is pretty simple. You start with a data set. Whoop, start with a data set that has missing values in it. You impute the data several different times. So here, uh, and you create um, newly um, created complete data sets. So you take this, the, the missing data, you impute, and you get a, a new data set that's complete. And you do that several times. Here, I've, I've just done it three times here. Um, Don Rubin initially suggested you do it at least five times. Um, nowadays, we sort of have a, a rule of thumb that suggests that um, uh, the data should be imputed. Uh, you, you construct a, an imputed data set for every percentage of missing data that you have. So if you have 12% missing data in your initial data set, you would do 12 uh, uh, imputed data sets. Then what you do, you analyze each of those data sets separately, but in the same way. And then you combine the results at the end to come up with your your full analysis results. So what you do is, um, um, yeah, so, and that, that, that involves uh, pooling sources of variation from within a particular analysis. So the standard errors that you might measure on a regression parameter, for example, and also the differences among analyses. So this acts to increase the standard errors of your um, parameter estimates, which is what we want because um, we, some of our data are, have, been in, have been simulated, so um, we don't, uh, so we want to take account of that. So that's the idea behind multiple imputation. Of course, how you actually do the imputations is the important question. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so how we do the imputations is the important question. And that's received a lot of research. So the method I'm going to talk about today is called MICE, multiple imputation by chained equations. And it's also known as uh, fully conditional specification. And the idea is that um, you specify an imputation model for each variable in your data set. And then you impute each value for each variable conditional on the other values and variables in the data set. So basically you, um, you build, what that amounts to is building a multiple regression model for each variable in your data set in terms of all the other variables, using that to predict your, um, your missing values. And then you move on to the next variable in the data set and you do the same sort of thing, but it can be a different imputation method depending on the type of data that you have. And we'll see some examples in a second. So you, yeah, as I said, um, uh, that's what I basically just said. And um, so the MICE package is available for R, 
And um, here it is in the general statistical software. It's the full description of it there. And um, this is a little uh, symbol for, um, for the mice page. Okay, some history first. I was the first person to use multiple imputation in, in ecology and evolution. And this goes back to 2003, uh, which I used the mice package, which we just looked, just saw briefly, and to impute data for a, um, uh, a database that was developed by Diana Fisher, uh, uh, looking at the uh, factors affecting the decline and extinction of Australian marsupials. So she had a lot of what we call extrinsic variables, which are uh, variables that uh, might be to do with um, predators or climate or habitat destruction, uh, those sorts of variables, but also intrinsic variables such as low population growth rates and, and low, um, uh, high to low um, um, uh, birth rates and, um, and litter sizes and things like that. So we had this big database. There was a lot of missing data. I was uncomfortable about using case-wise deletion because it got rid of most of our data. So I went to the literature and discovered multiple imputation and used mice for that. So that was in 2003. Since then, there have been a lot of studies looking at the missing data problem in ecology and evolution. And um, we, which is great, but a lot of them really haven't taken on board the idea of multiple imputation, that, um, uh, that it's an important, um, advance over single imputation. And so a lot of people are, uh, in these studies to compare methods, what they will do is well, they'll take a, a full data set, they'll randomly remove data from that data set, and then they would look at how good the imputation models are at predicting um, the original data for those particular missing values. So that's what they call the, the missing, uh, uh, the imputation error. So it's the difference between your um, values before removal um, to make the random data, and then the imputed values afterwards. So the difference between those is called the imputation error, and people have used that, but it doesn't really hold at all. Uh, it doesn't. It makes sense in terms of the single imputation method, uh, which I'm saying we shouldn't use, but multiple imputation, it makes no sense at all to calculate the imputation error, because in multiple imputation, you're not trying to predict the values um, uh, for the imputed, uh, the original values uh, for the imputed data set. What you're after is trying to draw um, um, values for, for your imputed data sets from the posterior distribution of the missing data. So you want your imputations to be different from each other. And you don't, you're not trying to um, sort of hone in on the true uh, data value uh, that was would have been there if the data were not missing uh, because um, if you if you knew that value then you wouldn't have to do any imputation and um, and and if you if you use a single imputation model you just get the same value over and over again for that data point whereas what we're after is uh, creating multiple data sets that are slightly different because they have different values for the uh, for their imputed values. So that's, um, so that's a problem in the literature at the moment that people haven't really understood uh, that, um, uh, uh, that um, people haven't understood uh, the difference between single imputation and multiple imputation and the idea that the imputation error is your measure of the effectiveness of an, of a, of an imputation method is, is, doesn't hold for multiple imputation. So, Okay, so, so a lot of these studies uh, use various methods to uh, uh, test multiple, test imputation methods. Uh, some of them are just pointing out uh, uh, the importance of, of dealing with missing data. So a few people have, have come on board with that. Um, uh, there's very few that um, deal with multiple imputation itself. So that's... <coughs> I'm particularly annoyed at this Shinichi Nakagawa and Robert Freckledon paper because um, after my 2003 paper came out, um, I just thought multiple imputation was a good idea. It solved the problem that I wanted to solve, and then I moved on. But um, but Nakagawa and Freckledon uh, pointed out that in fact this was a serious problem for um, 
macroecology and macroevolution, and then we should actually consider it. So uh, Shinichi here, particularly, he keeps writing my papers for me. This is this is stuff that I should have been doing at the time that I totally missed out on. So, um, uh, so that always annoys me, but I guess in science, some people have a good idea and implement it, and then the others, and then it takes a little while to catch on, and then other people um, come in and, uh, and do the mopping up work uh, around that. So anyway, I'm not bitter, don't worry. Okay, so what we need, if we want to do multiple imputation, is we want to, because we've got species databases uh, that um, <coughs> um, we have, uh, typically we have data from multiple species and we want to take into account the phylogenetic information when we do our multiple imputation because um, one important principle is that multiple the model for multiple imputation should in some sense um, um, be in advance of or take account of the analysis that you want to do afterwards. So we would like phylogenetic information. We don't actually have them yet. Uh, and we don't understand how phylogenies affect imputations in multiple imputation. And we need general methods that uh, are available for all data types. So we want to be able to impute um, uh, continuous data, which is relatively easy. Um, but we would also like to be able to impute categorical data, for example, or presence absence data. So we need general methods for, for doing that, and they're not currently available. So we could use EM methods um, for the full information maximum likelihood, uh, uh, but they produce it, and they produce imputations, but it's really a single imputation, and you shouldn't actually use those maximum those maximum likelihood values for further analysis. So, uh, and we can use the mice package to leverage off um, well tested and um, um, well known software. So. <coughs> What, me what methods can we use? Well, the first one would be predictive mean matching, and that's a hot deck method. So we're taking data, imputed values for our data from within the data set itself. And the idea is, is to uh, construct a predictive re regression equation for the data and calculate the predicted value for your missing data point. Then you look at the observed data that are close to your predicted value in multivariate space and you randomly choose one of the nearest neighbor observed values as your imputed value. So you're sampling from within the data set for variables that are, um, for, for values that are close and uh, to your predicted missing value. So that's easy to do, and you can use it for any data type, which is really good. Uh, like I said, it's a hot deck method, values are imputed from the observed values. And we can give this a phylogenetic flavor by instead of using an ordinary regression model, we can use a phylogenetic generalized least squares model for the regression equation. And also we can bias the choice of nearest neighbor values according to their phylogenetic relationship to the missing values, such that the donor species is more likely to be a close relative or sister to the species with the missing data. So we wanna bias, um, because we know the phylogeny, we wanna bias our um, imputed values so that they're more likely to come from a from a close um, a close relative. So we call this PHPMM, and to work out the probabilities, we just used um, uh, this um, paper from uh, Lapointe and Garland in uh, two thousand and one, um, which goes into how to calculate those probabilities. So, so. Uh, <clears throat> another method we can use is just to draw. Uh, variable uh, imputed values from a multivariate normal regression model, uh, again conditional on the other value, values and variables. And we can use Bayes to allow for the uncertainty in the regression parameters. So, so we can, we can um, for our regression model, we can draw, uh, use parameter estimates that are draws from the posterior distribution of the, of the um, parameters. Uh, so, but that re relies on multivariate normality. So you're pretty much restricted to using continuous data for this example, but, um, and also sometimes it can impute impossible values. 
So, for example, negative body masses, which, which is uh, a not very desired outcome. Nevertheless, it's really popular. Um, there's a whole book that basically um, goes into that by Joel Schaefer here, yeah, and I can recommend that book if you're interested in this model. So again, we can give it a phylogenetic flavor by using the phylogenetic generalized least squares approach. Um, and we can use the, the phylogenetic tree as for the variance covariance matrix uh, for all the variables. So we call that pH norm. And um, <clears throat> so when you're predicting a new value for a new species on a tree, you need to take into account the phylogenetic relationships of all the other species in the in the data set. And um, this is um, this is covered really well in this paper here by Garland and Ives uh, in 2000. So if you're interested in this method, that's what we use to, to base our method on. Okay, so we have developed uh, these two methods, pH norm and pH PMM. Uh, and we've developed a, an R package, which we call Phylomice. And it's an add-on package to the mice package. So we can actually use the software um, uh, mice engine, and we can just insert our new um, imputation methods into that, and it runs seamlessly um, in the background. So, okay, so mice is well-tested software. It's easy to use, and it's relatively easy to write new methods for. So, so that's why I'm using that. So this is a simple example of what you might do. So in R, you need to load the mice package, and then you can load our file mice package. And then to uh, impute the missing data, we use the mice function here. And so dat with missing is our data set um, with um, missing data. And just as an example, I've chosen six variables. So a data set with six variables. And one of those variables is the species names. And we can relate those species names back to a phylogenetic tree. So there, so we're gonna ask for five, um, five imputed data sets. And here's this method argument here tells us which imputation method to use for which column in the data set. So the first column turned out to be the species names. We don't want to impute that. We know all those. There's no imputation needed for that. And you couldn't really impute the species names anyway. Uh, and then for the second column, we used um, pH norm. For the third column, we used PMM. So that's the non phylogenetic version of predictive mean matching. Uh, so, and, and, and the same for all the others here. And you're not just limited to pH norm and PMM. You can actually use some of the other techniques. So for example, the log reg uh, method is um, uses logistic regression to impute presence absence data, for example, binary data. Okay, it's a, <coughs> it's, it's a Markov chain method. So we have to specify how long our chain is going to be. I've set it at 50 here, you could set it higher, um, um, but generally around 50 works pretty well. And finally, you have to give the function the tree uh, so it can do the phylogenetic work there. So, so um, using the phylomice package, it just acts like another, uh, the pH norm and pH MM, pH PMM methods act exactly like other methods that you would normally use for mice. Okay, so once you've imputed your data sets, we have five of them, we can get the completed data sets out of that. And then we can apply our regression model that we wanted to apply in the first place to each of those data sets. So we, like I said, we had five variables in the model. Well, we had six in the data set, but one of them is the species names. And we had five um, variables that we wanted to analyze using regression. And we can use the generalized least squares to analyze that. And we can estimate Pagel's lambda value uh, from that data as well. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, it's important to, be, when developing your methods, it's important to test them. So what I developed was a simulation study uh, that, um, uh, so we had 128 taxa, which is a small comparative study, but it's not unsubstantial. Um, we had so seven different trees that we tried. Uh, so we used a balanced tree, a random tree, a real tree, a star phylogeny, and we, we actually also lambda transformed the balanced random and real trees with a lambda of 
0.5. And I'll show you what these trees look like in a second. We had five explanatory variables and um, one response variable and an intercept. So we're going to fit a regression model with five variables. And um, um, I just better point out that when you're using multiple imputation, you don't have to be restricted to the variables that you're going to use in your subsequent analysis. So multiple imputation often works better if you've got say 15 or 20 variables, even if you're only going to use five variables, because those other variables will help you to get better imputations. So uh, this is a sort of, this present study is a, is a bit of an artificial study in that way. Uh, so for our regression equation, we had five variables and the effect sizes were zero. So hopefully when we estimate uh, this par the parameter for this variable, uh, it's not gonna be significant all the way ranging up to effect size of two and the standard deviation was one. So uh, this um, effect size of two we expect to be all, always significant. Uh, uh, I'm only gonna talk about the zeros and the twos here, the no, no effect and the strong effect because the, the results for these, these middle um, uh, effect sizes was, was intermediate between those and it just adds complication to the story. So, uh, so the so we I I induced the correlation between the variables because collinearity is usually a, an issue for these sorts of databases, but also because um, the um, uh, you need because this is a multiple regression method. Mice is a multiple regression method for each of the variables. Uh, you really need some explanatory power uh, for each variable to to be able to predict missing values for the other variables. So this just increases a little bit of collinearity into the data, which hopefully should make the mice algorithm work a bit better. We use three different sorts of um, missing data. So we use missing completely at random, missing at random, and missing not at random. And there's a function in mice called ampute, which is really good for creating missing data sets under these different sets of assumptions. And I looked at proportions missing between 5% up to 50%. Mainly, I'm only going to talk about the 5% missing and the 50% missing because the point, the 30% missing here uh, was had relatively intermediate results as well. We used the four methods that we used to impute our data. And what we're interested in is comparing among these methods. And it was all continuous data. I haven't used any categorical variables in this, in this simulation. And we did 10 replicates for each combination of variables. So that ended up being about two and a half thousand analyses uh, that I did, which took a couple of days to run. Okay, and what did we look at? We looked at the, the bias in the parameter estimates, which is the difference between the parameter estimates from the full analysis before you, in, before you remove, before you create missing values and the imputed analysis. So we do the analysis on the complete data set we remove uh, values within that data set, we impute them, and then we analyze the data again, and we compare that analysis result with the, um, the full analysis result. And we look at the standard errors of the parameter estimates, and we had several predictions. Firstly, that the parameter estimates would be unbiased, so our regression parameters in the model would be unbiased. If any bias exists, we predict it would be worse for the non-phylogenetic methods uh, because we thought our methods would be a good idea at the time. And as the percentage of missingness increased, the standard errors in the parameter estimates should increase reflect, reflecting the appropriate correction for the missing data. So these are the trees that we use. So this is a balanced tree here. You can see uh, the structure of that. This is a star phylogeny. So there's a single origin here and all the other, all the tax to come off uh, that, uh, that root node here. Um, this is a random tree just ge generated within the ape package for R. And this is a real tree, uh, which I've got from the Phylocene project. Uh, this is a random tree trimmed down to um, 128 taxa uh, from, from their project. Uh, this is the Phylocene project, uh, phylogenetic analysis of mammal ma macro ecology. And they've got a bunch of um, phylogenies on there that you can use. And also it's a trait database as well. So it's another useful aspect. I was, um, when I came across this, I was sort of tempted to use it because thylacine is a bit of a play on the word thylacine, which is the Tasmanian tiger. 
which is um, which is now extinct. And this is this is a this uh, this logo here looks very much like the Tasmanian tiger. It's got the it's got the stripes in the right places. So there you go. There's an Australian connection. Okay, so I, I mentioned before that um, we took our trees and we gave them a lambda transformation of 0.5. This is what these look like. So this is the balanced tree, the phylocene tree, and the random tree. And you can see a lambda of 0.5 extends the um, extends the branches. Okay, so what are the results? There's a whole bunch of these box plots here. They all look pretty similar. I'm going to point out the salient features, but um, if, if your eyes start to glaze over because of this, don't worry. At the end, I'll just give a summary um, slide so, um, with the main points. So the bias of the imputation methods. Okay, so we have on the x-axis here our four different methods here and here. And then we have for each of the tree and each type of missingness, we have the bias of the parameter estimates. And, um, <coughs> and so what we can see here is that, is that um, when the data are missing completely at random and we're using a star phylogeny, so the data are actually independent in this case, all the, all the methods show um, uh, unbiased. They're unbiased. The bias is equal to zero. And that's true for the different styles of missingness as well, if we're using a star phylogeny. Um, so it's, it works well with um, data missing at random, which you predict because that's one of the assumptions for multiple imputation, but it even works pretty well for missing not at random as well in this example. So, um, so you can apply um, um, multiple imputation to missing not at random data sets. Um, you have to be careful, but in this case it worked. Now, so, so that's for the star phylogeny. So that's independent data. So this is the situation in which we'd expect norm and PMM to work really well because they're non-phylogenetic methods and the star is basically a non-phylogenetic covariance structure as well. But they all do pretty well. But, <clears throat> but if we look at the, um, um, uh, the uh, trees that have phylogenetic structure in them, uh, so we have the phyla tree, which is the phylocene tree here. Um, you can see that the, the bias gets more variable and it's actually worse for the phylogenetic methods than uh, for the non-phylogenetic methods. Uh, and this was a big surprise to me because I thought um, the phylogenetic methods would perform better than the non-phylogenetic methods, but in this case it wasn't. And so that, that and you get pretty similar results for the, um, the phylocene tree versus the um, uh, the pale estimate of the, uh, so that's the, la it's the lambda transformed uh, phylocene tree, uh, which is sort of in, in a way, sort of in between the star tree and the, um, and the phyla tree. So, so, so these levels of bias are sort of intermediate between these two cases. Okay. Uh, what about the proportion missingness and uh, the size of the parameters? Uh, so uh, proportion missing this is either 0.05, so 5%, 30%, or 50%. And you can see when the proportion missing this is low, the bias for each method is quite low, or a bit more variable for um, uh, the pH norm method. And that's an issue. Um, uh, so that's probably the best case scenario where you don't have much missing data and your um, parameter estimates are very small, close to zero and maybe non-significant. Um, as, as we increase the amount of missingness, uh, the bias gets worse for the pH norm method. And um, uh, yeah, and, uh, but if we look at the large parameter estimates, so the ones that um, should be significant most of the time, the bias is, is, is particularly bad. So the, and, and that increases as the amount of missing data increases. So this situation over here is particularly bad. You can see that the norm and P, PMM methods, the non phylogenetic methods, they actually cope pretty well with large amounts of missing data and um, uh, strong effect sizes. The, the phylogenetic methods don't do anywhere near as well. Okay, so the standard errors. What we would wanna see in this case is the bias in the standard error should increase with the type of missingness, with the proportion missing. 
and you can see that um, it does, if we look at the, uh, it's, it's hard to see, but the, um, if we just look at the norm method, you should be able to see this is basically unbiased with 5% data, slightly above zero for 30% data, and a little bit further above zero for 50% missing data. And, um, uh, and you can see the phylogenetic method is a lot more variable, okay? And the bias is, is higher uh, for those in general. So this is, this is the situation that we would predict um, that the bias should increase with the amount of missingness for the standard error, okay? So the standard error is getting bigger as the amount of missingness increases, which is what we want. But it looks like the, the results are very variable for the phylogenetic methods, which might not be what we want. Okay, um, <clears throat> another way we can look at it is, uh, so this is the bias in the standard errors uh, according to the different missingness types and for the different um, uh, covariance structures here. So if we look at the, miss, uh, the missing, uh, so the bias is very little in the standard errors. If we just look at the star tree, so independent data, and it's not affected very much by the type of missingness either. But, and, and that pretty much holds for the, um, um, for the lambda transformed phyl uh, phylocene tree, um, but it's a bit more variable here for the, um, the phylogenetic methods, particularly pH norm, and that variability starts to increase as well uh, when you look at um, uh, the full uh, phylocene tree. Okay, so, so as the data become more correlated, you get more variability in the um, standard error bias. Okay, so that's regression parameters. What about lambda? So Pagel's lambda is a really commonly used um, um, measure of phylogenetic signal in this sort of data. And what you can see here is that as the, as the amount of missingness increases, uh, the bias of lambda also increases. In this case, it becomes more negative. So what this is, and this is true for all the methods. So even the non-phylogenetic methods are providing biased estimates of lambda and the values of lambda that you're getting are smaller than they should be. So this was another shock as well, because I was hoping that the phylogenetic methods would actually perform better, but they perform relatively worse, the more missing data you have, but all methods perform pretty badly. Okay. and uh, by missing values in, in covariance structure, um, there's some, uh, the, the effect is relatively variable, but it's more variable really for the, um, uh, the phylogenetic methods versus the non-phylogenetic methods. The standard error, again, we should, what we should see is that the standard error should increase as the proportion of missingness goes up, and it does. Uh, standard error, uh, it's, it's pretty close to zero. The bias in the standard error for lambda is close to zero here and it increases as we go up with the missing use values. But again, there's more variability in the, in the results um, for the phylogenetic methods. Okay, and uh, by imputation method, uh, the phylogenetic methods, um, uh, so standard error for lambda according to missing data mechanism and tree type, uh, the, um, the bias is largest for uh, when the data are missing completely random uh, and missing at random and missing not, not at random seem to be a little bit variable there as well. So not a lot of trends in that particular comparison. So where are we? All variables affect the bias and the standard errors of the regression parameters. The bias of the regression parameters increased, became more negative as the degree of phylogenetic covariance structure increased. So the amount of covariance in the tree is minimal, is zero for a star phylogeny. It's sort of intermediate for the, um, the Pagel's lambda transform true phylogeny, and it's, it's greatest for the, um, uh, the phylocene phylogeny. The bias of the regression parameters is low for the star, small regression parameters, and high for highly correlated data and large regression parameters. So if you have highly correlated data, 
you have um, large regression parameters and you have a large proportion of data missing, the methods do badly, but the phylogenetic methods um, work are worse. So the bias in the standard errors increase with the degree of missingness, which is what we want, but the phylogenetic methods were relatively poorly performing in that regard. And the bias in the standard error of the regression coefficients was relatively low with respect to type of missingness and covariance, but results were more variable for high covariance structure. So, and again, phylogenetic methods perform poorly. So <clears throat> for Pagel's lambda, all methods showed bias in lambda and this increased with the proportion of missingness. Um, so phylogenetic methods performed worse. There's no clear trend in the bias of lambda with the missing mechanism or the amount of covariance structure from, derived from the tree. And standard errors of lambda increase with the proportion missing, which is good. And standard errors were less biased for weakly correlated data. And standard errors were not affected by the missingness mechanism. So recommendations. Don't do single imputation. I've already said that. Avoid complete case analysis unless your data truly are missing it completely at random. But then you have to watch out for loss of sample size and loss of power. So complete case analysis is probably not the best thing to do. Consider using full information maximum likelihood. Uh, so phylopars and phylogenetic EM and phy tools. Um, but those, mo those models that are implemented in those packages are not necessarily the models that you want to fit. So you either have to roll your own, so write your own code to do it, or use the technique like multiple imputation. So don't use the missing data, maximum likelihood estimates for any other analysis. So this full information maximum likelihood, you end up at the end of it after using the EM algorithm, you end up with um, um, estimates of your missing data. You shouldn't use those in another analysis because they're basically a single imputation and you're back in the, uh, you're back with all the problems that that has as well. Okay, you can be Bayesian uh, and you'll have to put informative priors on the missing values, but that's certainly another option. Uh, and I think you can, but even though multiple imputation seems to have come across, come off worse in my simulations, I think you can use it if you're careful. So you check the quality of your imputations and there's software to do this. I'll talk a bit about that in a second. Um, don't use my methods. Don't use phylomice. The biases are too large and it's pretty slow as well because it involves um, inversion of variance covariance matrices that are quite large. And that's, that's a slow thing to do in R especially. Okay, if one thing that you can do is read a good book on statistical analysis with missing data. And this is the best one uh, by Don Rubin again. Uh, can really recommend that. Uh, so how do you check your imputation quality? Well, you can do something like this. This is just a, a figure I've pinched off the internet where uh, the blue lines here, so these are uh, seven different variables um, from a particular analysis. And the red lines here are the imputation, the densities for each of the variables for the imputations. And the blue thick line here is the, um, the, tr the density for the observed data. So what you want is you, you want the, the densities of your imputed values to be pretty similar to what the densities of your observed data are. And if these, so if these red lines differ, these red curves differ very much from the blue curve, then you have a problem with your imputation methods. I would say that all these seven variables look pretty good to me um, uh, based on this information. So there's no wild differences in uh, the imputation methods. A little bit of variability for this one, but probably uh, it seems to capture the mean pretty well. And certainly at the extremes, it seems to work pretty well. So, so that's the sort of information you can look at for each of your uh, imputation methods. Uh, I didn't do that in my simulations because it would have involved looking at thousands and thousands of these plots uh, to try and understand which, which were performing better or worse. But I, I think I'll have to redo the simulations, go back and at least look at a few of them to make sure that the imputations are actually being created and they're actually good. Well, I suspect that for some of the results the, um, uh, where the phylogenetic imputation methods perform poorly, um, 
uh, some of the results are, are not going to be too good. So it's something for the future. So <clears throat> estimating parameters in covariance matrices like Pagel's lambda is an unusual thing to do, um, particularly because multiple imputation was developed for the estimation of regression parameters. Uh, I went to the literature to try and figure out whether uh, some of these imputation methods uh, have been used for covariance and nobody's really looked at the effectiveness of imputation, multiple imputation for these sorts of um, methods that I'm talking about today. The sorts of data sets and methods that we're talking about today. One option I thought would be to look at the time series literature uh, where you have, um, say for example, in the law regression of order one, there's one parameter that you estimate that explains that, that used to construct the covariance matrix for the data. So there's a single parameter like our lambda that's affecting the covariance matrix. And I thought there might be some, some information on uh, multiple imputation to estimate that, uh, but I couldn't find anything to do with that. Um, uh, we could look at more complicated autoregression models. Uh, so, so this is the R2 model, it requires two parameters, uh, but it's a little bit more complicated and so even, but even the AR1 model isn't covered by anyone. So I think there's an opening there. Okay, so where to from here? We need more, better research into the imputation of missing values. Uh, we need to be able to read the rest of the literature as well. So the, the medical literature, the epidemiological literature, maybe some econometrics literature as well uh, to get ideas and um, Imputation for the estimation of covariance parameters is wide open, like I just said. Um, parameters such as lambda and autoregression parameters, uh, nobody really knows how imputation affects those estimates. Uh, and this could actually be quite a general interest, I think, to, uh, to other researchers in other fields. So it's a great time to be a phylogenetic statistician. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. I thought I'd better show you an animal picture because um, this has been a highly theoretical talk and I appreciate that, that some of you won't be, um, um, uh, some of you might have difficulty with some of the stuff that I've been talking about, but at least here's an animal picture. And this is, the, this is the animal that I did my PhD on so many years ago, so I have quite a strong attachment to these guys. Okay, sorry for talking so fast and that's the end of the talk. So I'm happy to take questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Simone. That was really, really great. Uh, so if anybody has a, a couple of quick questions, I know we're a little bit over time, but... Um, Sorry. No, it's fine. No worries. And you can shout it out or put it in the chat and we can read it. Yeah. All right, we got a chat from Eric Seaman who asks, can mice address massive imputation issues that result in noise? Um, <clears throat> so I think that um, firstly, from, from a multiple imputation point of view, you want some of that noise there because that gives you variability among your imputation values that you want to be able to use in order to uh, estimate the parameters using multiple imputations. So some noise is good. If, you're, if, the, if your mice will not work very well, if there is no relationship between your variables, um, such that there is no predictive information uh, from one variable uh, in order to predict other variables. So from that point of view, noisy, noisy data can be a problem, I guess. Uh, but um, I, I don't understand what you could do better, really. That's, that's the thing. And there are other packages that do multiple imputation, uh, but mice is my favorite and it's the one I have most experience with. And I think, um, so, so a little bit of noise is good. A lot of noise just means that you have very little information about what your missing data, your missing values actually might be. So um, that should still flow through the analysis because multiple Im imputation is, it's not like you're trying to predict the missing values, but what you are trying to do is use effectively the data that you do have. So I think that's um, uh, an important way to think about it. So don't worry. I don't think you need to worry too much about noise in the missing values themselves. 
that answer the question? I don't know. Okay, is there an easy way to test the EG function in one of the cool packages you mentioned, whether data are missing completely at random, uh, missing at random or, yeah. Um, so how do, you, how do you tell whether um, um, data are missing at random, missing completely at random or missing not at random? Well, I think you can look for patterns in your missing data. I think that's a good thing to do because uh, you might find that, for example, particular clades in your um, uh, tend to be have more missing values than other clades, for example, and that you might be able to see patterns in the missing data. So the visualization methods um, um, work pretty well uh, for doing that. A lot of it will probably be based though on your knowledge of the of the relationships that you should see and variables that should affect missing data. So that's that's the um, that's the case that I would. Um, so there's, there's, there's a role for substantive knowledge there, that if you can bring knowledge about the particular variables that are missing data and, and think about what, what other variables might affect that, then um, you might be able to get a handle on whether the data are missing, not at random or not. So it's, it's pretty hard. So, yeah. So in the end, what are you gonna do if you find that you're missing data are missing, not at random? Well, that's, um, you need to have a, a you need to go, back and look at your missing values and build up a model that predicts the missing values um, themselves based on um, particular, so you have to write a bespoke model basically that will only work for your particular case. It's not a general, there's no general methods for doing with missing not at random data. Although in this, in this, in this study, I found that um, all the methods perform pretty well on missing not at random data. So in, using multiple imputation might be a good solution anyway. Right. Cool, thank you.